then I have the pleasure to announce our next speaker, <coughs> Martin Jürgens. <coughs> Martin Jürgens is a photoconservator, started from the very beginning as a photographer and continued his education in paper and for uh, paper conservation and uh, conservation of photographic materials in the US and in Canada. <coughs> Came back to Germany, was a mistake probably because we need photoconservatives but there are no positions. So he started a freelance conservation workshop in Hamburg and then finally changed to become a photoconservator at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barnick. I'm just going to wait. Um, do I change this myself or is it changed? Not quite sure. I guess I change it. Here we go. I got it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Ah, wonderful. So, Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. In the next 20 minutes, I would like to travel with you to the tropics. We've already been to the tropics once this morning. Um, but we're going now to a completely different area of the world, uh, not to Middle America, but to Southeast Asia, to the hot and humid rainforests of central Laos. And this is where I've spent um, many months since 2007, working on the conservation of photographs in the Buddhist archive of photography in Luang Prabang, Laos. And you can see here the uh, this is the view from the central hill in Luang Prabang looking out onto the Mekong River. It's a fantastic place. Um, I recommend you all go there. Uh, Trying to figure this out here. Sorry, this is a. There we go. In 2007, I had been asked to participate in a project funded by the British Library. Money had been procured from the library's endangered archive program to um, conduct, a pi uh, conduct a pilot survey in a collection of photographs in a monastery, in a Buddhist monastery, in Luang Prabang. And following this, a conservator was to travel to Laos to initiate con a conservation workflow in order to preserve this collection for the future. The tasks um, that uh, were waiting for me were to perform a condition survey of the photographs, to create appropriate uh, storage conditions, to implement a workflow for preservation of the objects, digitization of the objects, and eventually treatment of the objects, if necessary, and to teach local staff and then to leave again. Um, that, you know, it sounds pretty straightforward, but it's actually uh, turned out to be a, a project of many years, and it's been five years now that I've been involved in this project. Uh, just to put Laos on the map briefly, so um, you all know South, uh, Southeast Asia. Laos is a landlocked uh, country um, in the middle of Southeast Asia, but it's less well known than, it's, um, than the other uh, countries around it like Vietnam and uh, Thailand, Cambodia, for the main reason, and it's very banal, that it doesn't have any beaches. So it's less touristically um, exploited until now, but that is, that is changing. And the, the ancient historic city of Luang Prabang is uh, right in the middle of Laos. It's on the Mekong River in the middle of wonderful rainforest, um, a tropical climate. And um, the city is fantastic because uh, it's the ancient royal city of, um, of uh, Laos, and it has over 30 monasteries within the city limits. Um, this is the monastery of Vatsen, founded in 1718, um, and it lies on the uh, main road of uh, Luang Prabang. Um, it's one of the most important monasteries in Laos, mainly because this is the residence of the venerable abbot Prakam Chan Virachitatera, whom I'll introduce you to in a moment. And you can see this is the main temple building, the Sim, and behind that is the living quarters, called the Kuti of the abbot. The venerable abbot uh, Prakamchan Virachitatera is the central figure in the Buddhist archive of photography. At right you can see the reception room um, of the abbot's living quarters, called the Kuti, as I just mentioned, um, as it was until uh, 2007. 
The abbot was surrounded by photographs. They were everywhere. They were on the floor, they were on the walls, in the cabinets. And um, I heard later that they were also under his bed, in the bedroom. Um, he had been collecting photographs for 70 years, and he was the driving force behind creating an archive of the, as it turned out to be, tens of thousands of photographs in the various monasteries in Luang Prabang. Unfortunately, the abbot passed away in 2007. In fact, um, on the first day of my first visit to Laos, and two hours after I had been given an audience um, in his presence. So that was, uh, that was a, an un, unusual start to a project. And um, we, all of the people involved in the project had a strengthened sense of immediacy and importance of carrying out the abbot's will to preserve and protect the historic photographs. So a location was found in a nearby monastery in Vatkili, and uh, this is the building that we were able to use. We used the second floor um, of this uh, building. It's a mixture of uh, colonial French style and um, Lao architecture. The novices were extremely curious of what we were doing, and word spread rapidly throughout the monasteries that uh, two foreigners, the German photographer Hans-Georg Berger, who was one of the initiators of this project, um, and myself, along with three young Lao men, were looking at photographs in one of the temple's rooms. As a result, we began to receive photographs from all kinds of uh, a large number of the town's monasteries. And it was a wonderful development um, because it showed how widespread and common photography was or had been in, in Luang Prabang. And it was also for, for all who were involved a tribute to the abbot's endeavor to unite the photographs of the region and protect them from being lost, stolen, or destroyed. Um, we decided early on not to try to create a typical Western-style or developed country-style archive with a strictly regulated climate control. There were various reasons for this. First of all, we didn't have the funding for this kind of um, archive. We were also aware that the supply of electricity was uh, not very regular. We had, there, were, there still are actually frequent blackouts in Luang Prabang. Um, we weren't sure if we would have a dedicated staff and how long-term the commitment would be on the part of the staff. And we also sensed that a modern vault, um, with all of the technology involved and modern materials, um, would, would have been very alien to this magical setting of, of the uh, historic um, monastery. So the room remains to this day without glazed windows, as you can see in this uh, image, um, only with wooden shutters that are closed at night. And during the day when we work there, a breeze passes through and brings slight relief to the heat. Um, of course, it also brings um, outside air with it, with uh, all the dust. The, the winters are quite dry and dusty and it brings high relative humidity in the, um, in the summer. So our best bet, really, was to create a passive archive with very active employees. The archive now holds roughly 20,000 to 30,000 prints. I mean, that's quite a, that's quite a uh, large uh, sort of uh, scale. Um, among them, a great range of processes, including mainly, well, mainly silver gelatin prints, but also uh, color prints, chromogenic prints, some Polaroid prints, uh, color photocopies, inkjet prints, collotypes, letterpress halftone prints, cyanotypes, negatives, and transparencies. It's quite a range, and the oldest prints go back about 100 years. Um, the abbot had been one of the few people who could identify the many monks and dignitaries, um, so his passing actually meant a great loss of information. And to understand, um, it took me a while to understand the role that photography plays in, in this community. Uh, traditionally, photographs in the possession of an abbot or a monk who has uh, passed away are often given to friends or family, or sometimes they're even uh, burnt with the, um, during the cremation of the body. So the fact that the abbot had decided to collect photographs um, is quite unusual. And uh, photographs of monks and abbots as well, of course, are held in high esteem by fellow monks, but also by the lay population since the image carries a part of the karma of the depicted person. So for this reason, the prints are often handled very frequently. Um, the material aspect of the print was very important. It, it, it was, of course, about, about the image, but it was also about the, the object, uh, touching the object. And it took me a while to realize that the touching of the photograph was, the, was essentially gaining access to that monk's karma, in a way. Um, and that is, goes against everything I had learned as a photograph conservator, where you try to restrict um, people from touching objects. So there was a lot of rethinking that uh, we, had to, um, we had to go through on that point. This is an album encountered in the collection of Atkili. Um, it shows the former abbot uh, Satu Kamphan, Silas Angvaro, 
who had died in 1989. And you can see a little bit of insect damage here and there, but most of the photographs have held up very, very well in this uh, cl climate, in the tropical climate. And I was repeatedly surprised at the uh, con good condition of the black and white prints. A lot of the color prints were not in, or color prints and color images were not in such good condition. This is an example of two um, 35 millimeter transparencies that I found. Um, you can see that one has held up quite well, and that is the um, slightly bluish Kodachrome, whereas the Ektachrome has really um, uh, reddened or Gone, undergone a change in color significantly. Uh, we chose to designate one corner of a second room in the building uh, for unframing and cleaning the extremely dirty frames. And my original design had included a table at sort of standing level, the kind of standing height, the kind of thing we, we might use in, in uh, our archives and working rooms. But I quickly realized that things happen differently, and so you, you sit on the floor while you work. So we, we readjusted everything. and. Um, I, I really had to learn that I was um, a visitor, essentially, coming with a good intention, but um, I, had, I had to learn that um, I was really the visitor. I had been asked to help, but um, of course I had to respect the, the, the tradition, and uh, it sounds easier than it is, you know. I'm, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good experience, actually. Only the objects with acute mold damage were treated. We didn't really have time for extensive treatment. Um, and we superficially removed the mold to the extent possible. And I, I taught some of the novices how to do this. Digitization was an important part of the project. And until now, about 20,000 photographs have been digitized with both an, a handheld SLR camera um, and with a high-end scanner. Uh, we implemented a very strict color management system to to improve our scanning quality, this was important to the project, and two of the staff members were trained in how to scan photographs. One of the most important aspects of the Buddhist archive uh, was involving abbots and important monks from the other monasteries. Uh, without their support, the project would never have found acceptance within the Buddhist community um, of monks called the Sangha. And the young man in the center is the project coordinator, um, Kamvon. Um, he spent a good 10 years in a local uh, monastery himself, uh, first as a novice, later as a monk, until he left the monastery. And he had been the personal assistant to the abbot, um, Satu Kam Phan. So uh, he was a respected personality in the community. And the two, young in the, back, the two young men in the back are former novices, and you can see how they're holding a respectful distance. And I also wouldn't speak directly to the abbots. Um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been my place to do so. We also though, um, involved local lay people to come and help identify people in these, um, in these photographs, because all of the photographs were described um, extensively in both Lao and English uh, language. So this was a very important part, and also including the non-Buddhist, uh, socialist slash communist um, uh, government and, and city um, officials was also very important in, in placing this archive in the community of the city. One of the principles had been to use only locally available materials and local craftsmen and craftswomen to the greatest extent possible. Uh, the region around Luang Prabang especially has a long papermaking tradition. So mulberry bark is harvested in the surrounding mountains and there are a number of papermakers in town and you can see the paper drying um, on, on uh, screens here outside in the midday sun. So I went to one of the factories, uh, papermaking factories. Factory is the wrong word, it's really a, a workshop. Um, to get an idea of the papermaking process. And I was, after a while, convinced that the recipes and procedures did result in a very pure kind of paper. Um, there were about 10 different types of paper to choose from, and most of them were of a, quite a high quality. We couldn't really do extensive testing. I couldn't do a PAT test. We didn't really have the budget or the time for that kind of thing. And we did have to make quick decisions. So I did some very basic tests. I, I put some paper out in the sun. I, I measured the pH of some paper. Um, to get a good idea. And in the end, we, we uh, selected a few of the papers to produce these boxes, which turned out to be quite sturdy, but also very simple folded envelopes. And the system should keep out dust and will give the archive a system of organizing the pictures according to size, subject, or to provenance. There are various ways we're, we're organizing them. For the color slides and for the negatives, we chose a different approach. And we used these um, slide boxes that I still had quite a number of at home. You can't really get them anymore. That era has passed. But um, we bought some local silica gel from the market, which is imported from Thailand, and we placed it inside these uh, slide boxes using a, um, a very simple uh, under 40% relative humidity, above 40% relative humidity um, indicator, and um, one inside the box, one outside, 
taped it with aluminum foil also from the local market. Um, and uh, that, was, that was a quite simple system. And the key here really is regular control. Um, just checking to make sure that we're keeping down the levels inside. The idea is really to reduce the biological growth on the slides, mold, essentially. Um, for storage cabinets, we decided against metal for four main reasons. Um, metal, especially the powder-coated type, um, are not manufactured in Laos, so they would have had to be imported and they would be very um, expensive and they would not support local craftsmen. Um, they would quickly rust um, in the humid environment and they're, I think for me the most important part was that their bleak sort of functionality, their aesthetic, would not fit into the monasteric archive environment. So we asked a carpenter to build cabinets fashioned on the traditional type that you find in the temples, which you can see on the left here. Um, and uh, these are the new ones on the right. Um, they're also a little bleak, but they're, they're still hold that, they still have that slanted edge, which is highly impractical because you lose a lot of space. But um, that was very important uh, to the monks. And they were, um, they're made of rosewood, a local rosewood coming from the forests. And we varnished them with a shellac uh, to try and uh, reduce any VOCs coming out of the rosewood. It's a really beautiful um, wood. Uh, termites are really the, the biggest threat um, to organic materials in Luang Prabang. And um, the good thing about termites is there's actually nothing really good about them. But the one good thing is that they avoid light. They don't like daylight. So um, this means that once we know that, it means we can work with that. Um, the, the bad thing about that is that they, whenever you have a cabinet with, with sealed doors or books that haven't been moved for a while, such as you see in this image, what happens is that the termites come up through the back and then they'll start eating away at everything that's not visible. So you don't actually see that they're, that they're working um, or eating, chewing. Um, so this is a, you know, the typical type of uh, damage you'll find. If you take out the book, you'll find the bottom and the back has been eaten away. So. Um, the interesting thing was that we had, to, um, we had to come up with a solution for this. And one solution I saw in the local stores is simply to put tables and cabinets in bowls of either water or oil. Uh, usually it's oil so that termites and ants can't actually crawl up the legs. But the novices did not like this idea. It was not possible to implement this in the monastery, within the monastery walls. So I quickly gave that up. Um, the only way really to avoid termite damage, and this is a quite an extreme example of it, um, was to be constantly vigilant, um, to keep the place clean, to uh, check rooms, cabinets, boxes on a regular basis. So this meant, you know, um, I, I like to speak of exercising the collection, which um, is, is sort of the opposite thing that we would do in an um, archive here, where we try not to exercise the collection. We really try to leave it alone and, and not always go in and take objects out because we might endanger them in that sense. Here, the opposite, I think, is the case. We have to go in, we have to open the cabinets, open the boxes, and check, and make sure everything is clean and there's no infestation. And an important element of the project was teaching basic conservation skills to the project staff. So during my first visit, I thought that I needed to begin with identification of photographic materials or processes. So I tried to explain the differences between the photographs I had found um, during the survey. And it was soon clear that there was no real equivalent in the Lao vocabulary to all of the photographic terms I had been using for the first two weeks. And um, nobody had really told me that they didn't understand what I was talking about. Um, so there was a communication problem there. Uh, we were all very polite to each other. And to resolve the situation, we had sessions where we sat down and I brought out uh, objects and and showed what a, what a negative film is. There's no word for negative in, in Lao. Um, it's just called film, which is, which is kind of interesting because there are also glass plate negatives in the collection. Um, and we, we did, put, in the end, put together an English Lao um, glossary of the most important terms. Um, a very rewarding moment during the project was when we had been allowed to search for photographic materials in the Kuti, that's the living quarters, of the deceased abbot of Vatkeli. And they had been sealed for 20 years after he had passed away. And among, among many other things, we found a portrait of the abbot, uh, Satu Kamfan Sila Sangvaru, and that's whom you, whom you see here, on a porcelain plate. So we took it out to the doorway to get a better look at it. And I placed it down at, at the doorway. And after we had looked at it, two novices came, uh, came in, and um, they stood in awe of this picture. And one of them bent down to, to touch the plate. And I caught it on, uh, with my camera this moment. Um, and it was a very significant moment. I really understood. It's, it's really about the access to that person, that you're getting through the image of that person. 
um, this touching was really part of the um, of the whole you know the whole goal of keeping these photographs. Um, so saving them is really a, a worthwhile task and. Um, um, most importantly, I haven't mentioned this, but all of the images come out of the Buddhist community themselves. They're not pictures of Westerners, um, of the monks, but the monks had their own dark rooms, they had their own cameras, um, they took pictures, they were artistic, a number of them were, were artists and would paint in, in watercolor and so on. Now the, art, the Buddhist archive of photography will continue to grow, but the types of images will change. As you can see here, digital photography, of course, is uh, ever-present um, in any situation. Thousands of photographs are being taken in all ceremonies and so on. So this will cause new challenges within the Buddhist archive of photography. And we're not really sure, well, you know, I ask myself, what's going to happen to those digital files? And will our backup procedures that we have in place be sufficient? Do we have to come up with other ideas? And I also can't help but wonder what the status of um, digital images will have compared to the revered photographs that I've just mentioned that are actually on paper or on, on some other material support. So that's something that's, um, that we'll have to see how, how that develops. And, you know, there is, a, there is a rainy season in Laos. Of course, it's quite long. It goes from May through August. It rains and rains and rains. And um, the force of that rain is quite impressive. And each time as the rain begins, or began, we would struggle to close the, the wooden blinds in the archive to stop rain from coming in. Um, but of course, there being no window glass, we often you know, have to leave them open a bit so we could essentially work with, without getting too hot. Now, we learned the hard way that the roof was not, um, was not waterproof. Uh, this was at the beginning, and luckily there were no photographs in these uh, paper folders. But um, the physical object, the building, which I haven't talked about at all, was, was still an issue and is to this day an issue that still causes problems. So starting in one month from now, the building will be renovated and modernized, and glass windows will be installed, and perhaps even an air conditioning. The whole city of Luang Prabang is developing rapidly, so this step is understandable. I hope that the Western concept of a closed and tightly controlled storage facility will work in Luang Prabang given the frequent blackouts and the ever-present danger of insects and mold growth. Um, the British Library funding for the collection ran out two years ago, but the Buddhist Archive of Photography has by now found a secure foundation in the Luang Prabang community, and it will continue to exist so that the efforts of the past five years are not lost. And I'd like to conclude now by sharing a few um, insights that resulted from this project. First of all, the clocks in Laos and Europe seem to tick differently. Um, uh, one races ahead at an incredible pace, leaving it hard for you to catch your breath, while the other takes a more leisurely pace with lots of time to think things over. And this is actually a luxury that I really, really enjoyed in Luang Prabang, was to have time to think things over. Secondly, much can be done with very little. And I think this is an important realization for any project, be it well-financed, high-tech, or a small, simple one such as ours. Third, conservation is not a rigid affair. Allowing for different ways of solving problems, making compromises, are fundamental in bringing a project to success. And finally, I realized that photography can mean very different things to different people. And um, sometimes we tend to forget that within our own institution and work. So I do hope to be continued to, or to continue to be involved in the archive's well-being. And um, I'm currently preparing a new trip to Luang Prabang for next spring, um, February, March to view the results of the modernization of the building. And I'm a little skeptical, I have to admit, of what, what, the, what they're planning to do. And especially this conference has been helpful in sort of shaping my ideas and giving me new ideas about um, buildings and sustainability in this type of setting and with the problems that we have. So let me end by thanking um, those involved. Of course, the Venerable Abbot uh, Prakam Chandirachi Tatera, um, Hans-Georg Berger, who initialized this project, uh, Kamvon Buliapon, who was this uh, project coordinator, the British Library for the initial financing, and the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam for letting me be here, and of course uh, Bertrand Lavitrine, um, and this, uh, I can't see where he is, and his organization for inviting me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any questions? Lunch is exhausting. Ah, good. Not too exhausting. <laughs> well, um, yeah, 
Yes, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I was lucky, I've been to Lampulong Prabang and, and it's really a wonderful place. Actually, I wanted to ask you um, with whether um, you could create or whether you have thought of creating a special protocol um, to find a compromise between um, local significance, uh, the significance and the meaning of these photographers and for them being able to touch them and um, conservation requirements. Is yes. There, did you establish something? Yeah, I, I think protocol would probably be the wrong word. I mean, no, uh, for me, uh, it's, it's the right word for you, but the wrong word for me because, um, um, for example, we had the issue of touching and um, at first we thought, okay, we'll use, um, we'll use white gloves as we do here, and uh, cotton gloves, for example. But um, after 10 minutes, the cotton gloves were humid and dirty and really unusable. Um, so we decided not to use those. And we thought about rubber, you know, um, natural gloves. But really, you're, you're in a wonderful setting. Everything is, is wonderfully old and, you know, it's beautiful wood. The walls are, are exude, you know, centuries of use. And, and then you come in with a clinical glove. It, it didn't work and it, we saw immediately this was not going to work. Um, so Hans Georg Berger, the, the initiator um, of the project, he came up with a good idea and he experimented a little bit with it. We used uh, wooden skewers that you put meat on for barbecues. And um, we talked to some monks, and you know, we said, well, would it be would it be possible to to use the skewers to touch the photographs and to move them around a bit and to pick them up? And and so they tried it, and they liked it, and um, and it turned out to be a nice solution. We were both we were both quite happy with with how that worked. Um, um, but essentially, I felt that actually. Touching the photographs was the least of the problems these were photographs were having. I mean, the main problems were really mold, um, insect damage, theft. Um, tourism is increasing in Laos. That means um, things are being stolen out of temples. Um, everything that's not you know, nailed to the floor is stolen, essentially. Um, so there are big, big, big issues, much bigger than the issues we were dealing with. Um, we spent a lot of effort in just securing the building against theft. Um, there was always someone sleeping in the building. Um, you know, we put locks on the doors. Uh, you couldn't really reach the second uh, story, but um, so th those were issues um, th that we were dealing with. Um, and in terms of uh, mold, the only thing we could do was really open the windows, well, open the shutters and let the air pass through. Um, I'm a little worried about the modernization efforts that are underway now. Um, I really hope that um, this won't be a mistake. Um, I do understand that a lot of the things, that the situation now does not fulfill a lot of our normal expectations in terms of climate and handling. But for the situation that we had and the situation that still exists in Luang Prabang, um, I do feel that it was a very, very simple and yet fundamental solution that tended to give the, the, the archive its, um, its, its uh, gravity, I guess one could say, without, without endangering too much the, the traditions of the... Um, of the photographic uh, heritage. The, sorry, did that answer your question a bit? Yeah, okay, great. Any more questions? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh. Ah. Gael, <coughs> yeah, it's not visible from here. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, you give us two examples of adaptation of uh, uh, classical way of working with uh, local uh, realities, by example, with the sticks and so on. Yeah. Can you give us some other? Because I think it's it's wonderful to see all those ideas of uh, not only the adaptation for conservation, but at the same time respect of local tradition. Can you give us some? I'm sure you 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 have plenty, but can you give one more? For my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, um, perhaps I, I did mention at the beginning of the talk that um, photographs were being brought to this one monastery. Well, it wasn't quite that simple. I mean, in, in one sense, yes. Uh, suddenly there was this sort of buzz in, in town um, about these, this idea of, a, of an archive. And um, um, so some photographs were being just brought to us, but th that was a little bit dangerous because we suddenly realized that um, 
we didn't know where they were coming from, and we were losing the um, we were losing their their provenance, let's say. So we, we, we quickly said, you know, we told the novices to stop bringing us photographs. And instead, we sent out emissaries to the monasteries to actually find out where the photographs were coming from. So it was, um, and I, I was lucky to be able to accompany them at some points. So we would go to a monastery, we, would, um, we had heard that there were photographs in that monastery. And we would um, have an appointment with the local abbot, and we would sit down on the floor and... Um, and it was very, very, um, very strict. The abbots are highly respected. Um, they sit on their on their sofa. We sit on the floor. It's a very hierarchical system. Um, and the first the first discussions, as they were translated to me, were always about um, not about really the photograph, but just about getting to know each other and and finding out who you are. Um, so this isn't really an adaptation in that sense, but it's an indication of how how important the um, sticking to the hierarchy was, the the in, the cultural hierarchy in that in that society that I as a foreigner didn't really understand, of course, but luckily we were embedded within the team of monks who were very good at facilitating that. Um, another th another thing perhaps was um, teaching teaching photography and teaching scanning. Um, we there there are some real whiz kids. I mean, they know everything about computers. Um, because they grew up with computers, they they didn't they weren't novices in temples, but they they grew up essentially in computer shops, um, you know, selling selling mobile phones to to people. And what we tried to do is to to take them and bring them into our into our world, if you will, and teach them how to scan photographs at a professional level. Um, so using their their whiz kid knowledge uh, to sort of adapt them to to cultural to cultural scenarios. Um, other things is that uh, any any time we wanted to make a major change, we would always have to uh, communicate this to the abbot. And uh, there were lengthy meetings and ceremonies and uh, lots of chanting. And uh, so all of these things played a role. And it really, really slowed down the project. But that was actually a good thing because it gave us time to just relax and, and really think things through and make mistakes, of course. And then um, so those perhaps are some examples. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat>